Okay, uh, shalom. Um, so uh, I don't see all the people who were here before, but uh, I guess uh, that's what we have. Okay, so um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, theory of uh, deep learning, which I'm sure many of you heard about. Um, <laughs> just to you know, uh, so some some people already approached me with all sorts of uh, very advanced questions about my talks. Uh, so if all of you already know everything I said in all the videos I had uh, on, the <laughs> on YouTube in the last uh, two years, uh, then I can really start from the more advanced stuff. But so how many of you actually watched any of my talks? Seriously watched? Yeah, okay, good. So uh, I'll go very quickly through uh, some very just to, to, to set the ground for the more advanced uh, material. This is the end of your course, so by now you should all be experts on machine learning. So we can actually uh, say some uh, really uh, some of the things I never get to talk about uh, in uh, in the short uh, conference talks, uh, which I'm more and of course I encourage you to ask questions all the time, as long as you let me speak from time to time. Okay, so uh, so as you all know, I mean AI AI is uh, has this very nice three phases: uh, the old AI, which is just logic uh, expert system. Uh, Essentially, rule-based. Uh, I mean, lookup tables. <laughs> See this, do this. I mean, there's not much more than that there, and uh, of course, it never really worked seriously on anything that uh, beyond the uh, you know, very simple uh, rule-based rule system. Yeah, that, that, that exists, but they are not very clever. I mean, and in the 80s, we moved to what we call statistical learning, which is essentially um, the very deep idea that we want to generalize from a sample to the whole population. And, and we need to do it by using statistics. And essentially, we, this was all about what we now call, uh, I mean, all of statistical machine learning between the mid-80s and uh, the, the, the deep learning phase was essentially curve fitting in high dimension. With all sorts of sophisticated names, and uh, but it's not just curve fitting. If we do curve fitting, we, as, as I'm sure all of you know by now, we just fit a function to data we need to uh, to be careful <laughs> because if you have just uh, data is the, the points here uh, we can fit all sorts of functions and of course we can fit very simple function like this line and we can fit maybe something like this and then we can go to very high order uh, polynomials or whatever Fourier expansion or whatever you want and eventually fit the data very nicely but then we we are doomed to what we call overfit which means that we we are going to fit the, the data, especially the noise in the data, uh, too good. And this will uh, completely oscillate like crazy outside of the data. So, so all of machine learning between uh, the 80s and, and the 2000s was essentially, I mean, I'm very simplifying things, but essentially just how to regularize this particular curve fitting problem in high dimension, which means how do we avoid overfitting and, 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 and ensure re regular generalization. But as I'm sure all of you know, I mean, curve fitting is a very old idea. I mean, this was actually invented uh, more than 200 years ago by Gauss. He was the first one to do regression through, through data. And he already understood most of the principles, including the notion of generalization very well. And he already told us that we should avoid trying to fit the data too good, because then we are going to miss on, on out of training samples. Okay. So if you understand this, you basically, and all the rest are just all sorts of funny specific tricks on how to do this regularization in high dimension. Uh, and of course, the, the, the basic rule of, uh, of machine learning, which is actually the rule of statistics, is that in order to do this, the number of parameters of these functions, let's say you're, you're fitting polynomials, so the, the number of coefficient, polynomials uh, coefficients should be of the order probably less than the number of data points. So this was the, the rule of thumb. Uh, and this was a very, this was really, a, this was something formulated by Gauss, as I said, and, and essentially, essentially remained true uh, until uh, recently, <laughs> more or less recently. Uh, uh, and, and this was really, so the number of data points is clear. I mean, this is independent samples that we see. And the number of parameters, this was a little more tricky because it's not always just the number of parameters of the function class. It's, it's more like you know, the dimensionality, the VC dimension, or, the, or some other dimension of uh, the, the complexity of the, the class. So this has to be uh, 
explained what we mean by number of parameters, but essentially this was the rule. I mean, <laughs> you want to generalize, have enough data not to exceed the, uh, not, not to overfit with these parameters, or essentially more data points than parameters, or free independent parameters. If you understand this, you know machine learning. Of course, what's really important about it is you have to choose the right class of functions, what we call the hypothesis class. So, so in this case, uh, let's say if I want to fit it with polynomials, I probably should go to quite high degrees. But if I actually realize that this data has this very nice oscillation, so maybe fitting it with sine functions would be much better. So you know, just put a, a sine with some, you know, um, maybe two or three parameters. I mean, phase, uh, amplitude, and, uh, and uh, offset, <laughs> phase and amplitude, essentially. Uh, and, then, and then you can uh, fit it very nicely with only two parameters. Much better than with polynomial, let's say, much more parameters. So, so choosing the right class is very important. And actually, the ability to generalize depends on what is the class, or what are the properties of this class. And, and, and this is really what you care about in machine learning most of the time, the, the, the VC dimension of the class, the, the, the random complexity of the data in the class, all sorts of measures like this. Essentially tell us how well I can fit this particular data with this particular class of functions. That's it. That's all you need to know about machine learning. The rest are just details. No. <laughs> the problem is that, as I'm sure you know, that we actually have this uh, strange third phase of artificial intelligence, which we now call deep learning. And I think we very clearly, distinctly, uh, well, it actually started in the 80s. And we, need, we, we actually, and a lot of the proceedings and uh, basic understanding of, of neural networks have been already, already in the 80s, actually very predicted already in the 50s by, uh, by, by Frank Rosenblatt to essentially just propose the deep learning uh, model that nobody believed in then. <laughs> and it was suppressed by Minsky and Papert for about 15 years, came back in the 80s, and then suppressed again by Vapnik and came back in the, in the 2000s in this new form of many, many layers. And so, what, so the, you all know that, I suppose. And, 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 and surprising, surprisingly to everyone, so you all know what the, those neurons are, are, I suppose. I mean, just those linear threshold functions. I mean, so essentially I just take the input, multiply them by some adjustable weights, take the dot product, and then put it some so, through some sort of nonlinearity, which can be just a sign, but sign is not very nice because it's not differentiable. So either put it some, through some smooth sign, like a sigmoid function, or through some other things which are easy to differentiate, like ReLUs which have a, a zero, one uh, uh, derivative, very easy to calculate derivatives and so on. So that's not the only reason for using values uh, because they're very easy computationally. And, and many other things. I mean, uh, usually we like to have uh, some sort of saturated linearity, and, and, but uh, even if it's not saturated, we, we can control it by some sort of regularization. So these are the neurons. And then, of course, we put them in many layers, and we have these very nice uh, towers of many, many layers of uh, neurons. OK, so this is deep learning. The surprise was that, you know, that we trained deep learning essentially by this very naive algorithm, which we call uh, stochastic gradient descent or, or error backpropagation, which is essentially, okay, you put the label, let's say uh, a picture, the pixels of a picture of a dog, and then you want the label to be dog, but uh, usually it doesn't come out dog immediately, so you have to adjust the weights. And how do you adjust the weights? You just backpropagate the, miss the errors by using the chain, chain rule of derivatives layer by layer, and that's essentially is the backpropagation. I'm sure you all know that. And surprisingly, this very stupid algorithm, which is nothing but uh, small changes of the weights in the right direction, we, we don't even calculate the exact gradient. We calculate some noisy version of the gradients, because usually we calculate them on what we call mini-batches, I mean, just parts of the examples. So it's not even the gradient of the training error. It's an approximation to the gradient of the training error. But surprisingly to everyone, this eventually learned those functions uh, pretty good, actually in some cases better than anything before, or even at, at human performance, let's say, for object recognition or, 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 or speech recognition and things like this. And, and this is what, what I call the big surprise. I mean, so wh why does it work so well? I mean, this is, this is crazy. I mean, actually, what we do here is a, is a model with a huge number of parameters. I mean, I mean if, if I'm talking about, let's say, about a, an image of uh, megapixels or something, um, millions inputs or hundreds of thousands of pixels in the input. And then most of the layers are still very big, so there's that millions, 
and millions of adjustable parameters. Even if you do use convolutions, you use all sorts of tricks, there's still millions and millions of parameters. And then we train them on hundreds of thousands of examples, still a lot of data, but it breaks, immediately breaks this basic rule that the number of data points should be larger than the number of adjustable parameters. Surprise, surprise, this doesn't overfit as badly as we could expect. And not only that, they seem to do wonderful job. I mean, better in some sense than any previous machine learning algorithm. And this was a surprise not only to all of you and me, but also that the people who invented it, if you talk to Jeff Hinton or Jan LeCun or whoever, they never predicted it to be so good. OK, so why is it so good? <laughs> so of course, this is a, it became a very big, uh, important question in theoretical machine learning. I mean, uh, so you know, everybody, everybody who has some theoretical uh, <laughs> ideas uh, is trying to come up with some sort of uh, explanation. I mean, what's going on here? So I'm going to tell you about my own explanation, <laughs> which is not, uh, certainly not the only one, and certainly not the last word on the story. It's still a very, a very big uh, open question to a large extent. And it's, very, it's highly controversial. I mean, uh, OK, I, a lot of people don't quite agree with me on everything. You should know that. And I'm going to address uh, those objections. Some of them are interesting. Some of them are stupid. But it's, uh, it's still, uh, it's still uh, I just want to make, make sure that you know it's a work in progress. And, uh, and uh, things are changing every day in terms of the, the quality and, and depth of this understanding. But surprise, surprise, I'm working on it, on it for about five years now. I think the tower, the building, stands on. I mean, it's still there. <laughs> and it's still uh, one of the more interesting uh, explanations of why these kind of things work so well. And that's what I want to share with you. But take it as you should with a lot of grains of salt, as, as you know. OK, so, so again, the, the interesting property of deep learning, I don't know if you see this, is that most other algorithms tend to saturate in performance in terms of size of data, whereas uh, these particular machines seem to improve when you add more data in a, in, a, in a way which looks quite surprising. I mean, you don't see any, any sign of saturation. You just add more data, and you get better, better models. I mean, in some sense, this again contradicts the notion that you saturate the parameters at some point, and you can't learn anymore, as, as happens in most other machine learning models. So eventually, the, the, the other data is just going to maybe refine your parameters, make them uh, sharper and sharper, but not really improve the performance. So something else is happening here. There's some sort of an adaptation of the model to the data. Uh, and more data you give, I, I adapt, which is a very big no-no in machine learning. I mean, I, I essentially fit my class to the, to the data, to the problem. But somehow, I avoid, I avoid, I avoid the, the terrible overfitting that such a thing could, could do. So that's why big data and, uh, and deep learning really go together very nicely. <laughs> we need a lot of, we get, uh, use a lot of data, we get better and better models. For speech, for natural language, for computational biology, for control, for whatever problem you have in mind with all the many different versions of deep learning today. But again, what's going on there? I mean, the, I mean, of course, the other problem of deep learning is that you have so many parameters and so many in internal structure there, I mean, so, so many different things there, that essentially I, I can't really interpret it very well. I mean, I, I don't really know what was learned. What are the features that the, the, the model eventually kept, captured and what it didn't capture? And of course, we all know that I can relatively easily cheat it. I mean, I can have those adversar adversarial examples and that just in a small, you know, un invisible change to the input, let's say I take this dog and, and change, I don't know, 20 pixels here somehow. You don't see any, any big difference. Oh, in most cases, I'd say I can, I can pick these pixels very carefully. And then the same network recognizes it as a cat or as, a, as an airplane, so, which is a very big problem for the whole technology because if the whole thing is so fragile, you know, I cannot use it for anything serious. I mean, I cannot put it on an autonomous car because it will see a, a stop sign like an arrow, or it will see or, or in, in medical diagnosis, or whatever you want to use it, which is really critical, <coughs> and those type of arrows can kill it. If I cannot put guarantees on the probability of such an adversarial example to, to actually work, it's, uh, it's going to eventually make the whole technology useless. So we really urgently need to understand both What's going on there? I mean, to have an interpretable model, which I can actually tell you why it learns and what it learns, 
And the other thing is make some sort of guarantees that it's going to perform well, at least uh, not in the worst case maybe, but uh, almost always <laughs> in some sense. And that's essentially the, the, key, the key issues with this technology. Despite the fact that it's actually changing the world, we don't really have both interpretability and, uh, and uh, sufficiently powerful guarantees on performance. So that's the, the state of the art as far as we understand. And the way I want to think about it, as many of you have seen already, I'm just going to go through it very quickly, is, is uh, to, to think about one particular aspect of these networks, which is also a good way, at least in my opinion, to think about other things like the brain or like m any other machine which has these uh, consecutive su successive layers or, 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 or representations or some, some sort of hierarchy of representations. And deep learning is a very nice model for that. So I'm thinking about deep learning, first of all, as a, let's call the input X, and the label Y, and the label is, of course, independent of the data, of the, of the model. So I can, the label depends on the statistics of the world. So let's say I have images, and I have uh, one bit that tells me, is this my picture or not my picture? Uh, so Y can be very simple. I think about it just as one bit. And X can be very complex. Megabits, megapixels of an image. And then, surprisingly, this neural network is taking my X into through a cascade of transformations, which are essentially those hidden layers, which I can call, I call here age, and later I call T. Never mind, this is just an historical slide, so I keep it. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and something interesting happens. Originally, of course, the information about why is there, just as the information about the, the identity of the dog or identity of me, but there's no single pixel in the image that tells me that's me or not me. And actually, the, so this one bit is highly distributed all over the place. So the whole, the whole miracle of deep learning is, is the ability to squeeze out somehow this one bit layer by layer such that at the last hidden layer, I can really put just a hyperplane through the data, through the representation and separate it into the pictures that have me in them and the pictures that don't have me in them. So the whole story is this uh, distillation of information, if you want. I mean, I'm actually getting out, at least by, by in two different, two different independent ways. One of them is filtering out irrelevant things, which I think is very important. And the other way is to change the topology of the representation, such that from highly convolved mixing, originally the pictures with me and pictures without me are very similar. I need somehow to put things which are very close in the initial layer to be very far in the, far in the, in the last layer, and vice versa. I mean, things are very far in the initial layer to be very close in the initial layer. So there's this combination of two things. One of them is this uh, topology transformation. I'm changing the neighborhoods of objects, of, of images. And the other one is somehow filtering, filtering irrelevant things, which some people agree that's important, some, some less. So the way I want to think about it is really as, as a cascade of uh, filters. I mean, think about it as a, a cascade of pipes <laughs> that are actually leaky. I mean, <laughs> so some information is going, some flow of information is going out at every pipe, so, but eventually they get narrower and narrower, or at least narrower in conception, not necessarily narrower in terms of weight, in deep width, but narrower in terms of how much flows through it. You can think also about it as some sort of a cascade of of nonlinear filters, this is more for engineers, but uh, maybe you identify. So I put an, I, I filter one, some frequencies here and some frequencies here, and eventually I filter enough such that the last layer see only the relevant fre frequencies. So imagine that let's say, the label depends only on the, the ratio of two kilohertz to one kilohertz. So everything else is not important, and uh, so I need somehow my 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 layers to get rid. And if I do this, I actually improve the signal-to-noise ratio of my decision and therefore improve generalization. So that's a very simple idea. I mean, I'm, I'm, I just want to understand how information is flows through the network and how is it filtered, if it's filtered, layer by layer. Now, the fact that we actually have uh, many layers here means that there's actually a Markov chain. I mean, for given the weights, when the weights are given are fixed, each layer can be calculated only from the previous one. So that's a Markov chain of representations. And Markov chains are nice because they have all sorts of mathematical properties which I can use. So I just want to remind you, and I just fixed the equation from visual information which was written here. <laughs> so uh, 
so mutual information is a, is a, <laughs> is a very important uh, quantity which I'm going to use from throughout my talk. Uh, so essentially, I, I need you all to be a little more familiar with those uh, quantities I'm sure many of you heard of and know about. So the first one is what they call the KL divergence or the cross entropy or the information divergence or it has many different names <laughs> and, and, many, and many different <coughs> meanings. You essentially take for any two distributions of the same variable, just take the log likelihood ratio and the log is important. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the likelihood ratio take the log and then average with respect to one of them the average, so it's the average log likelihood ratio of two distributions. Now this is a this is a very important uh, quantity. First of all, it's a non-negative quantity, and it's zero precisely when the two distributions are the same, and uh, and it has a lot of meaning which I'm not going to get into. But and it's really the fundamental measure of information uh, in information theory. I mean, it's 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 some sort of generalization of entropy, but uh, so entropy is just the same when I put Q to be one, let's say, or, 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 or constant, and then up to a sign, it's, it's essentially the entropy of X. And this measure the entropy of X relative to Q. That's why it's called sometimes relative entropy or cross entropy. Now, uh, if I take the, the KL divergence of the joint distribution of two variables and compare it to the product of their marginals, PX, PY, then this particular KL divergence is called mutual information. And it's essentially zero if and only if pxy is pxpy, which means that the variables are independent. And otherwise, it's not zero. And I can write it in various ways, like this way, px given y divided by px, or py given x divided by py. This is exactly the same thing. And, but if I look at it this way, I see that this is actually what we call the entropy of x, which is some, uh, minus some px log px, minus the conditional entropy of x given y. And if you think about entropy, as, as a measure of uncertainty in my variable, I know, I'm sorry that I move all the time. This is uh, just to make you awake. <laughs> um, so <laughs> to keep you awake, yeah. So, so essentially, uh, this is the uncertainty in the variable x, which is the entropy of x, or how many binary yes, no questions I have to ask on average in order to identify x. Uh, that's, that's the relation to code length, other things. Minus the uncertainty of x when I know y. So the difference between these two is how much uncertainty of x is removed by knowing y. And if uh, y is uh, independent of x, then these two are the same, because knowing y is not going to tell me anything new about x, and th then it's going to be 0. If y actually predicts x, or has a lot of information about x, this is going to be higher and higher. And of course, this is bounded by both the entropy of x and the entropy of y. So if, if an entropy of y is just one bit, the mutual information between x and y, no matter how complicated it is, cannot be more than one bit. OK? So that's a bit of a headache for some people, but uh, it's all right. Now, one of the basic properties of mutual information that I'm going to use uh, and I want you to remember, if you don't know already, is what we call data processing inequality. So mutual information has this very interesting property that if I go along, along a Markov chain, so y depends only on x, and z depends only on y, and so on. So I have the same type of arrows that I have between the layers of my network. I have a f forward Markov chain. Then the information cannot increase. The information about x in y cannot be smaller than information about x in z. And if I have more, so I have this chain of inequality. Now, one immediate consequence of that is that if I just take a one-to-one -one transformation of my data, so let's say phi is an invertible function, and, and psi is an, psi is an invertible, invertible function, the mutual information doesn't change. Because then I have data processing inequality in both directions. So uh, this is actually a big, a big problem, because uh, mutual information can be completely insensitive to very complicated transformations of my data. So let's say I can increase my data. It's a one-to-one -one transformation, but it's very hard to invert. Computationally hard. So I, I, but the mutual information in principle doesn't see this. It's completely invariant to such things. But if you try to encrypt your images before you train them a deep learning to recognize them, you're going to have a problem in most cases. Because in order to make sense of them, you need somehow to break the encryption. 
and this can be computationally as difficult as you want. So, uh, so um, uh, if you just do this, uh, the labels are going to be essentially random labels. There's no structure in the data that can identify by doing this. But information is not going to see this at all, uh, in principle at least. All right, I'll come back to this. This is one of the, the most uh, important and misunderstood concepts about uh, mutual information, which has been around a lot of, uh, in, in many of the papers that followed us uh, criticizing us. Uh, so this, this concept is a little bit uh, confusing. So now what I want you to know, since I'm sure most of you are not information theorists, so I actually want to talk in, in the language of what we call encoder and decoder. So if you think about it, the, the layer x, the input x, is mapped by some sort of a stochastic or deterministic map, I don't care at this point, to each one of the layers. So let's say I look at the layer two, ti or hi, the encoder of the layer, th that's the language I'm going to use, is the map from x to t, or is the probability that t has the, the whole layer, again, I emphasize this, I'm looking at the whole layer, not just one neuron. The whole layer is one random variable. What's the probability of this configuration given this configuration? This is what I call the encoder of the layer. And of course, the other part of the, each layer is the decoder of the layer, which is the map from the layer to the label. So essentially, when you move through the layers of a deep neural network, I'm sorry, this may be mine. Uh, so uh, essentially, the encoder gets more and more complicated when you move from layer to layer, in some sense. And the decoder gets simpler and simpler. And the last layer has a very simple decoder, but a very complicated encoder. So the complexity of the problem somehow shifts from the encoder to the decoder when you move through the layers. Now, there's also what I call the optimal decoder which is, okay, given this particular representation, so let's fix this part of the network, what would be the best way of decoding Y from this decoder, not necessarily what the network is doing. So that's the base optimal decoder, and that's essentially the decoder from TI back to the label Y, the, the desired label. So this is the desired label. This is the actual output of the network, which is not always the same as Y an approximation to y at the end, but it's not always the same as y. So this is what I call it, why I call it y hat. But the map from ti to y is really, is really the best optimal decoder. That's what I call the base optimal decoder. So now the, the first uh, non-trivial statement that I, I'm saying is that when the, and that's really important, I mean, when the network gets very large, in the sense that the input becomes large enough that I can use asymptotics, the same nature of asymptotics we use in information theory all the time. So I can talk essentially just about, just on, only about typical X's and not all of X's. And that's again important. Typical in, this, in the strict mathematical sense of typicality, which I'll define in a second. Then, surprisingly, when, when both X is very large and, and most of the T's are very large, only two numbers become important. Out of all these millions of possible parameters, possible weights, the, the picture that you really want to keep in mind is uh, only how the mutual information of the encoder and the mutual information of the decoder behave. The optimal decoder, the, the best way of decoding Y from this representation. And I, I call this IXT and ITY, I, and ITY for any one of those Ts. And eventually what determines the trade-off between accuracy and sample size is these two values of the mutual information at the last hidden layer. But actually, the, the story is very interesting you know, to understand what's going on in the layers, between the layers. For every one of those layers, these two numbers, information of the encoder and mutual information of the decoder, which at this point you don't really see why it should be important at all, uh, they really tell us, again, in the, in the large scale limit, and, and that's exactly where we are now, with very large problems, uh, it, it tells us more and more everything we want to know. Everything else is less important. It's, uh, some everything else is like details that you don't care about at the end. Yes? You are talking about uh, networks that are all already trained. You're not talking about no, no, I'm talking about during every stage of the training as well. 
OK? So, so again, so, so this is uh, something which takes time to grasp, because uh, what do I actually say here? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, this is very much in the same spirit as uh, Shannon's uh, uh, coding theorems. Uh, sorry, which I hope you heard about. I mean, <laughs> so essentially, there are two, two types of uh, fundamental results in information theory, what we call the source coding and the channel coding. Source coding is about how much I can compress my data given some distortion. And it's completely dominated by one function, the mutual information at a given distortion. No matter anything else doesn't come into the game, the rate distortion function. And, uh, and, and channel coding is telling what is the maximum information I can actually reliably transmit through a noisy channel, which is known as, it's a maximum mutual information that can possibly go through this network subject to all possible distributions of inputs. And this is the uh, subject to the cost of transmission. So that's what we usually call the capacity or the capacity cost function of the. And essentially, what Shannon told us, forget about all the other details. <laughs> as long as the rate is lo less than the capacity, you have reliable communication. You can, in principle, have reliable. What I'm saying here is something. It's not exactly. It's not a. It's not a communication problem at all. It's a learning problem. But I'm telling you that the generalization error and sample complexity are eventually determined by only these two numbers how much mutual information there is in the last the layer encoder, and how much mutual information there is in the last layer decoder. Now, to prove this theorem, we need, uh, to, I need much more time than I have now. But I, I want to illustrate it with something I'm sure many of you have seen, because this movie got somehow famous. So essentially, what I do here is uh, take a very specific network, small problem, where I can actually estimate the mutual information exactly by counting. So everything is finite, and all the joint distributions are just counting patterns versus representations. And of course, I discretize everything. That's one of the problems uh, with everything. I'm, I'm actually discretizing both the layers and the inputs, such that I can actually just do counting. So these are details how we estimate information. I, I'm going to come back to that. But essentially, what you see here is this is, this is what I call the information plan, or the info plan. This is the information about the input in every one of the layers, t. And this is the information about the output in every one of the layers. And, and what you see, that this goes from 0 to 12, which means I have only 12 bits of entropy in my pattern. So the, the patterns are just 12 binary variables. And I have one bit of label. So this goes from one, 0 to 1, because I x, I t y is less than I x y, which is 1. OK, so uh, and what you see here are taking the same ne neural network, which I'll show you in, in a while, and initialize it randomly. So I initialize all the weights with some Gaussian distribution around 0, as we always do, <laughs> small, small, small width around 0. And, and, uh, and then I repeat the same initialization randomly for 100 times. And what I pl we plotted here with Ravid, uh, Ravid Schwarzeev, uh, essentially, uh, th is the, it's the location of each one of the layers in this plan in the initial condition before I trained anything. So what you see here, due to the specific architecture, so the first, the first actually, the first and second hidden layers are here in the, in the blue, which means uh, they have essentially most of the information or all the information about the input, 12 bits. Of course, it is the input in some sense. And, and, and essentially, all the information about the output, one bit. But the more, the more I, I go in deeper into the network, I, 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 I immediately I, I lose more and more information about the, the, the output. And the last hidden layer, which is these uh, orange circles here, this is the, it has essentially the beginning, before I started to train, two or three or something uh, bits about the input. So almost forget everything about the input. But essentially, zero information about the output. Yes. My question, I am not uh, completely understand. What do you count to uh, actually measure this? Uh so I, in order to calculate measure information, as written there, I, I need to know the joint distribution of x and y. I need, and then if I have the pxy, then I can calculate this. This is simple. Okay. Now, in order to have the joint distribution, you need to put all the x's <coughs> and see uh, how, how they how they feel the, 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 the cells of each one of the t's. So, so what I'm saying is that we actually discretize the t's, discretize those representations. So let's say 
instead of thinking about continuous function, we divided them into 20 different levels or something like this. How we did it is interesting, but not, not very important now. And, well, and now we just have 4,096 points, which I see how they, how they distribute in, the, in these many, many possible representations. Once I have this, I have the joint distribution. If I have the joint distribution, I can calculate these quantities. That's what we did. By binning the, 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 the intermediate layers, actually we did it very carefully. We, we bin the layers such that, such that uh, information, the performance of the network didn't hurt. So I know that if I quantize the layers to 20 levels and just keep them quantized, <laughs> So instead of a smooth nonlinearity, I have uh, this stepwise, stepwise constant nonlinearity. I know that the performance of the network is not going to hurt. So this is some sort of a, I know it's some sort of a coarse graining of the representation, but I know that it didn't hurt my performance. So there was no other information that went through the layer that was really essential. And that's the way we did it. Okay? So that's, so essentially this is just counting. You have the joint distribution, you count how many X's fell into how many T's, and then you normalize and calculate this. This is a small problem, only 4,096 4 patterns. Everything can be done almost by hand. I mean, okay, it's not really by hand, but it's a very simple problem. <laughs> okay, now uh, the interesting story, the first thing that is already striking is that these 100 different networks initialize completely differently, so they have very different weights, look very similar in this plan. They what we call concentrate in this plan. But then we started to train it with back propagation, with error back propagation, stochastic gradient descent, with some mini batches. And I'll talk about the mini batches in a second. So that's what we see when we do this. So what you see here, there, up the number there, is the number of epochs of training, which means how many times I cycle the data. Okay? So you see that uh, essentially we went from zero to almost 10,000 epochs. And, uh, and uh, we see this very incredibly consistent movie. So no notice all the layers of all the networks, <laughs> although there is absolutely no connection between them, they're trained on different examples, and they're trained, initialized in a very different way. They all look up to you know, statistical scatter, very similar. They all go up to this point. You see at this point, this is about 300 or something uh, epochs. Uh, all the, the last hidden layer looks very nicely concentrated. So all these 100 different ne networks look here. The second layer looks more or less here, and so on. And by the way, you see the data processing inequality. You see that when I go through the layers, information goes down. Information goes down both about the input and about the, the output. That's what I expect from D DPI, from data processing inequality. So uh, that's very nice. Uh, first of all, there is an issue of why do they concentrate? I mean, they should have been all over the place or they could have been over all over the place. And this also, uh, actually I can tell you that we did it of course on many, many different networks. Small problems, large problems, real problems, uh, artificial problems, and CIFAR, uh, ImageNet, uh, whatever you want, a lot of different problems in the, in the last two years. Of course, the larger the problem, the harder it is to do this uh, estimation of information. So you need all sorts of tricks to do that. But essentially this is the kind of picture we see all the time. And the larger the problem, the sharper the concentration. They look very much in the same place in this plan. So I mean, some, some other, all the details of the network, all those different weights, somehow average and concentrate eventually in the, in, in the meaning of these information quantities. Now, the second thing I want to emphasize is that you have this very quick, you see this very sharp uh, improvement from the beginning, around 300 epochs of training, up to this point, where essentially, if you notice, all the all the layers moved a little bit to the left, to the right. So this moves from here to here, to from two to five or something. And, uh, and of course, up. So what the moving up in this plan is improving the information about the label. Improving the information about the label is directly, immediately related to generalization error. So more information is better generalization. Actually, this is e easy to see. And that's why using uh, the Pinsky inequality, for example, that any reasonable measure of generalization is bounded by the emission information. So this is essentially a generalization error. Perfect generalization is one. Anything below it is less than one. Okay, so by 0.6 or 0.65, I don't know, bits that you see here in the last layer, is still a relatively poor generalization. Okay? 
Now, but the surprise is that from this point on, you see this uh, very different type of trajectory. They keep on climbing up, but they also move to the left, which means all the layers essentially forget, in some sense, information about the input. And the last layer at the end is, is very much in this very nice point, which it has essentially one bit about the input and one bit about the output, which means that it remembers only, from all the complexity of the input, only one bit, which means, is it me or not me? This one bit that I really want to remember. So this is what we call in statistics, this is a minimal sufficient statistic. This is the minimum I have to remember in order to make a prediction, a good prediction. But all the other layers somehow spread along this line. And again, since most of you saw it already, uh, this is just the average of these clouds. You have questions? Yeah, I have a question. So here you take uh, a problem which can be like a perfectly solved by this network. But I almost said. So uh, otherwise we, we, would, uh, we, wouldn't, we would never reach this That's right. Uh, that's right. Absolutely right. So I assume, and that's I assume it all the time, that the networks are sufficiently rich, the expressivity is sufficiently high to actually find my function. If this is not true, then of course you're not going to get there. And we'll see this in a minute, okay? Now, so this is really the summary of the, the movie, uh, the previous uh, chapters. Uh, essentially, uh, uh, what you see here is just averaging those clouds, and you see that very quickly I go from A to C. This is why the, the trace is uh, faint, because it moves there quickly in 300 epochs. This C is a very interesting point. From here on, I start moving up and left, which means I'm starting to forget of the filter out information about the input. And you see this is much slower when I mean, you see the dense trace. OK? And eventually, I get to this point E. And if you really notice, it's actually curved down a little bit, which means I'm not perfect in my prediction. I'm almost perfect. The down means overfitting? Yeah, no, it's not overfitting. It's not overfitting, it's because of the stochasticity of the rule in this case. The rule is a little noisy. I have some noise, noisy labels. And because I have noisy labels, I'm going to get down. OK, so remember this picture. I'm going to use uh, this type of picture all along, but the whole point of my talk is to understand this picture and to see wha what it means. That's it? Lost you? OK, sorry. <laughs> uh, the yes. L4 and L5 are so close, it means that you don't really need the last layer. Uh, it doesn't give you a, a lot more to, let's say, accurate. Okay, so one of my interesting questions I'm going to address, I, I, I am shocked to see that I'm almost out of one hour, but uh, essentially, I want to understand this picture in all the details. I mean, what, co what caused this kind of trajectories, and when, where exactly are those layers going to end up in this line? And you see, surprisingly or not, that they not all the layers move to the left. I mean, they stop at some places. So each layer, layer five here is, layer five is the last layer. Okay, never mind. So that's the, the output. Layer four, layer three, and then layers two and, and one and so on. They all move a little bit to the left, but they stop at some very interesting places. So which means that they represent some very specific uh, details about the data. Now, let me just ask you, I mean, I can take a break now if you really urgently need it. Otherwise, I'm in the momentum of talking, so let's go on. <laughs> OK. If you need some uh, physiological breaks, you can take them in. OK. So, uh, so I, I, uh, I want to understand this picture. This is really, and, and actually, I argue that there is a lot to understand here. I mean, what's going on? So the first question, of course, is this, uh, is this the general picture? I mean, is this something you see in all the networks? I, I say that it is, <laughs> yes. What are these mutual information values? I mean, what do they mean? So I already told you that information about the label is essentially equivalent to generalization. This is an interesting quantity. What, is, what does it mean to compress the representation? Why information about the input I is important? And why it's important that it goes down? So you know, the intuition about filters, filtering out the irrelevant information actually makes sense here. So eventually, during the second phase, where I compress the representation, I, I lose information about the input, I actually filter out some irrelevant details. So that's the intuition you should, you should keep in keep and I just want to show you how it happens. <laughs> What's so special about stochastic gradient descent that makes this uh, ability to compress the representation uh, so effectively? Because this is really the miracle here. 
And then we get all sorts of bonuses. And once we understand this, we understand many other things. And uh, okay, yes. So, yes. Okay. So, yes. Said filtering. It's filtering information, or maybe clustering. Well, cl clustering is some sort of filtering. It's a very special type of filtering, because it means that you you only want to remember the identity of the cluster, not the details within each cluster. So you're right. I mean, the mechanism of filtering is, is, can be thought of as clustering. But it can be thought of also as dimension reduction. OK, so let's, let's try to see what's going on there. So I have a toy problem. This is a toy problem, which most computer scientists uh, never play with. I mean, who in his right mind is going to write a paper on, on a 12, inputs, uh, 12 binary inputs today? I mean, it will never get into any of the conferences in machine learning. Just by looking at the size of the problem. Well, that's exactly why computer scientists are completely wrong, because there's a lot to learn from small problems, <laughs> which you can only see in small problems when you can actually calculate everything, like neutral information, something like this, without any problem. And if you immediately jump to very large problem, you're not going to be able to see anything. So I urge you, all of you, this is coming from physics, by the way, <laughs> think about small, simple problems which you can actually understand, and then get the insight. OK. So that's why I had a hard, hard time publishing these papers. Because the first reaction of any reviewer, you're looking at a joke problem. It's not interesting. OK. So it's actually very interesting. And, and I'm going to argue that, this is, a, that this, is a, this is actually some very deep lesson that you can learn from this small problem. And then, of course, we're going to, when we know what we want to see, we see the same in large problems. Now, so the first question. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip all the issue of how to, mutually, how to measure mutual information. I just want to remind you, this is a little bit uh, technical, but I want to remind you that mutual information of continuous variables is defined only by discretizing my variables. So discretization is very much in the definition of entropy and, and mutual information of these continuous variables. So this delta is essentially my bin size. Essentially, how much I, what, what is my quantization? And, and you have to keep it fixed as long as the data is finite, because otherwise you're going immediately to get infinite information or infinite entropy or whatever, the maximum possible entropy. So you keep this fixed, and only at the end, when you take this delta to zero, you need to know what you're doing. You have to do this limit only after the data becomes very large. And then, actually, what we look at is the ratios of information to entropy and information to information. And this is a well-defined quantity independent of delta in the limit. And that's why this is just a technical thing which some of you may care about. The other thing is, why do I have concentration? I, I again, just want to sketch this very briefly. And why the log is so important in the definition of entropy and information. So essentially, let's imagine that you have an image, OK, pixels of an image. So one of the standard assumptions about images is that a small patch, let's say one pixel, <laughs> is the probability of this being of any color essentially is determined by the neighborhood. So if I take a small neighborhood of the pixel, I can essentially give you a very sharp probability of what the pixel is going to be, unless there is some noise there. <laughs> okay. So this is what we call the Markov random field in some sense. I mean, I can, so I can factorize. So x here is one image, let's say. And I can essentially tell you the probability of one pixel in this image is completely determined by something which in graphical models we call the parents or the, 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 the other pixels that affect this. And this is a small neighborhood. So, so this probability is factorizable, or approximately factorizable, with respect to these small patches. This is true for images. This is true for speech. We use hidden Markov models, for example, which are also saying locally there is a factorization. Or it's true for DNA, and it's true for control, and it's true for essentially all the problems which are actually successful for deep learning. So, but this, if this is true, this log likelihood ratio, or log probability ratio, see how it's there, essentially factorizes into a product over those neighborhoods or patches. And then it turns into a sum because of the log. But this sum is a sum of conditionally independent terms statistically. So each one of them is essentially independent of the other. So this looks like a sum of independent numbers. And the only important things you need to know about statistics, really, everything else are details, is that sums of independent numbers concentrate. 
This is called the central limit theorem in some, in some circles. <laughs> but essentially, it tells you that if you sum independent numbers and average, they're going to get sharper and sharper. Concentrate around the mean. And that's exactly what happens here. If I have this assumption of locally factorizable models, both ixt and ixy are going to get concentrated around some numbers, both unconditioned and conditioned on my on my representation. And that's, that's a crucial and very, a very strong assumption that you actually see in the data. And that's the reason why we have this concentration of measures. OK. But actually, it's a deeper story than that. I don't know if, if I, how technical I want to be, but just, again, for the experts here. Essentially, I'm saying something very strange. I'm talking about fully connected networks. There's no assumption. There's no convolution. There's nothing. And this fully connected network is essentially a one-to-one -one function from every layer to the next layer. So if it's a one-to-one -one function, let's say that I don't ch change the width of the layers. So it's a one-to-one -one function. Even if the, if the weights are random, I mean, it's still a one-to-one -one function with high probability. So how can you lose information? So of course, this is the basic correct criticism that I got from a lot of people, especially Zach et al. and that really pushed us, uh, bashed us to the ground in some sense. Uh, I mean, uh, how can you lose information if you have uh, reversible functions or uh, invertible functions? Now, uh, this is much trickier and much harder to understand, but it's exactly the same argument that physicists see in statistical mechanics. How many physicists are here? Zero or oh, one, OK. <laughs> Good. But uh, I, don't, I can't assume that you all know that. So, uh, so essentially, it's the same type of question that happens when the, the, you know, the microscopic dynamics of nature, Hamilton's equations or whatever, is reversible. Completely <laughs> independent of the direction of time. But macroscopically, we see increase of entropy. Or we see irreversible laws, the second law of thermodynamics. Surprisingly, this is the same kind of thing that happens here. So if you take a very long, a very big uh, matrix of random weights between each of the layers, they tend to decorrelate. So the first order correlation goes to zero with the size. The second order correlation goes to zero. The third order, all the lower moments are, are decaying with the size of the net. This is something you can easily prove if I have a random connection. But the information is not lost. So where is the information? So the information is pushed to the high moments, to the more complicated functions. But if I have some sort of noise in my problem, or some sort of quantization, or some sort of coarse graining, they're all different names for the same thing. <laughs> then I'm losing this information. It's actually not accessible to me. So again, here you have to be very careful. When, you, when I said that information is, is invariant to one-to-one -one transformations, I forgot that if this one-to-one -one transformation is extremely complicated, it's really scrambling my data, I'm going to lose information if I just coarse grain a little bit. And that's exactly what, by this small binning or small noise that I, is always there, because I have finite precision, information is eventually decaying, despite the fact that theoretically there is no loss of information. Now remember that. And now look at what happened when I have finite samples. That's actually quite interesting. So, so this is the, the network you saw so far. Color here is the number of uh, training epochs. So black is 0, yellow is 10,000. And it's linear in between. So what you see along the traces is the number of epochs that it takes the network to get to any one of these points. This was with 80% of the data. It's a finite data, so 4,096. 80% is around 3,000. And this was with only 5% of the data, 200 examples. Now, the surprising thing is, and the, the middle is the middle, yeah. <laughs> the surprising thing is that essentially the first phase is almost identical. I mean, they very quickly climb up to this green line which is this transition point from fitting the data very well and then losing information about the input, which I call the diffusion phase or the forgetting phase. Now, when I, don't have when I have enough data, this diffusion phase is actually pushing me to these very nice places that you saw before. But when I don't have enough data, this diffusion phase is killing me. So this is really the analogy of overfitting. I mean, I don't have enough data. But I forget, I force myself to lose information. I filter out, but this information is, is wrong because I may lose the, the correct information. That's exactly what happens. So this, the data is not enough to protect me 
for compress the relevant variables. And that's why I get this decay. And eventually, you, you, you see that the layers fit uh, on a different line, which is very different from this one. And they lose information. And eventually, I don't predict very well. OK, but the first phase, surprisingly, is essentially the same. Now, I, actu I actually call the first phase something like ERM, I mean, empirical rationalization. You just feed the training data. More or less, not perfectly, but you get to a relatively low training error. But it seems that most of the work, most of the generalization is actually acquired during the second phase, the, during, the, during the diffusion or during the, the you, know, you don't know yet that it's diffusion, but during this compression phase. And this seems to be counterintuitive. So what I am saying, here for the first time, we are not just doing curve fitting. There's something new in deep learning, which is different from the classical curve fitting. It's this, uh, the ability to ignore the irrelevant in a very systematic way. I'm not saying it's not happening in curve fitting. It's happening indirectly because you regularize your class. But here, it's, it, it's done explicitly through the training by stochastic gradient descent. I want to show you the second aspect. So this is the filtering aspect. I want to show you the topology change. So I don't know how, my, how well you see it. So this is, this is a Tisney two-dimensional embedding. You know what? How many of you heard about Tisney? OK, all of you. So it's uh, essentially just a, a, a nonlinear mapping of the high dimension to low dimension, such that I can actually view them, that preserve the topology. So preserve local neighborhoods are preserved more or less. So close by points are close by also in high dimension. The farther away topology is, is screwed away, but never mind. So what you see here is the topology of the first layer of the network, the first hidden layer. Uh, where, so these are 4,096 points here. The same network that I'm talking about all the time. But they, they are colored by black and red. This is a little bit hard to see. I'll, I'll zoom out, zoom in a little bit, so maybe you see this. So you see that some of the points are black and some of the points are red, and some are yellow. Which means, so black is if the network initially classifies them correctly, with one, let's say red with minus one, or the other label, and, and, uh, and, and yellow if it's somewhere in between, and not confident enough. OK? So now I want to show you the dynamics of the training. This is, by the way, trained with 5% of the data. And this is trained with 80% of the data. So it's the same two, two extremes I showed you before. But now let's look at uh, what happens during training. This is again due to Ravid, who is very good at these kind of things. Oops. Oh, oh OK. It's, it's still alive. So essentially, you see this uh, type of dynamics. So this is the dynamics. That, remember, I'm training the network. So I'm doing this stochastic gradient descent. And I want to see how not only the classification changes, I know already, but how I want to see how the topology of the representation change. OK, so now uh, let's accelerate it. I move all the way to the end. <laughs> and what you see here that with enough data, you get these very nice clusters of black points and red points. It's a bit hard to see it here, but these are two different colors. OK? But th this is in no way separable, linearly separable. I mean, I cannot just put a straight line here, which will separate the black from the red. OK. So the, 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 initial the, the first layer representation is really very complicated, even after training. I'm very confident. You see that I, all, the, the, all the points are labeled. By the way, if I see the same in the, in the 5%, you see that the confidence here is much lower. You have a lot of yellow points. So here, I don't, I don't, uh, co I'm not confident. But the topology, and you get this, uh, what the neuroscience calls salt and paper, pepper type of mixture, I mean, it's really, uh, it really looks uh, unseparable. Actually, it's separable in high dimension, but never mind that. Now, look what happened at the fourth layer. So remember, we have six hidden layers here, or five hidden layers here. This fourth layer is almost the end. It's still high dimension, so I, I use Tisney to project it. If I look at the same, the same training data, the same training dynamics on the fourth layer, and, uh, something is strange here, but good. So, so essentially, I want you to, to, to pay attention to this picture. So at some point, when I go through about a 1,000 uh, epochs, you see what happens. First of all, there's a very nice separation. The black tend to move to the, to the right, and the red tend to move to the left. But then if I keep on training, oops, sorry. If I keep on training, 
eventually it, it goes through this very nice transition. All the blacks are here, all the reds are here. And eventually, uh, ah, eventually it looks like this. And at the end, look what happened. There's this low dimensional manifold. In this case, it's one dimension. <laughs> all the blacks are here. All the reds are here. They're very clearly, nicely separable. This, by, by the way, I get this reduction of manifold dim dimensionality also in the 5% in the case. But here, you see, there's a lot of yellow, which means that I'm unable to actually classify the, the patterns correctly. So this is a very nice illustration of this topology change. I mean, I, the representation completely changed the neighborhoods, what is close and what is far during this training. And if you actually look at it more carefully, you really see that this topology change haps, happens in some jumps. Here, for example, I suddenly get this reduction of dimension. It happens actually in several jumps. Very, very small, important points, which are critical points in this dynamics. So the nice thing is we actually understand pretty well what's going on here. So I'm going to skip some of the theory now. I just want to tell you the summary of it. So essentially, why, why is the compression so important? So this is something I said in many talks. And it's a little technical. Again, I, I prefer to skip it now and to go to new things. But essentially, what I'm saying is that you have to replace the classical generalization bounds. I'm sure you've seen it in this course. The pack bounds. I hope you saw it. Which essentially tell us the generalization error or the generalization gap, the difference in training and generalization. Square is bounded by the log of the cardinality of my hypothesis class divided by the number of examples. This is, and then usually what we do is we, we cover the hypothesis class by some epsilon covers, and we say that this goes like 1 over epsilon to the d. But this is the dimension. This can be the busy dimension, it can be the Hauser dimension, it can be the fat chattering dimension, it can be many dimensions that have essentially the same meaning. It's the topological dimension, like the fractal dimension of my class. Uh, and this essentially tells me, okay, if, if there is a cover like this for every epsilon, then plugging it here gives me d over m as the leading factor. And the confidence is completely irrelevant in large problems, uh, if, if you can forget about it. Now what I'm saying, and I'm just summarizing, summarizing a, a very uh, a sl slightly more involved argument that when you compress the representation, when this t, you can think about it as clusters, or think about it as partition of my data into, into groups, the complexity of the class is dominated by the size of the cover. And the size of the cover for typical patterns, and this is where information theory comes in, and this is where the size of the problem comes in, it's large enough. The number of all possible inputs is 2 to the entropy of x. Uh, if you believe that, fine. If you don't believe that, that I need more time, I prefer not to do it now. Why 2 to the entropy is the cardinality of the, of the typical number of x? And the, 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 the same typicality argument tells me that the average size of the partitions is 2 to the conditional entropy on x on t. This is a, an information theoretic argument which those of you who saw the proofs of Shannon's theorem should recognize. But since I can't assume it here, I just ask you to believe me. But if this is true, then the cardinality of the class moves from 2 to the x to the cardinality of the set, 2 to the h over 2 to the h over t, which is essentially 2 to the i. So I get this very interesting uh, bound, which I actually argue is correct, but it has to be careful. You have to be careful with it. Essentially, a generalization error is completely dominated by the difference in the mutual information of the last hidden layer. I mean, how much the last hidden layer captures about y compared to the perfect prediction. So this is generalization error. And what happens here is that the effective dimensionality of the representation at each layer is essentially two to the mutual information that this layer has about the input. So this is very strange. This exponent is actually telling you that every bit of compression, since I'm moving to the left of my picture in the layers one bit, is equivalent to doubling the data, so a factor of 2 in m. So every bit of compression, every <laughs> small movement to the left of my image is essentially equivalent to having twice as many data points. So it's very effective. I mean, compression is an extremely effective mechanism of improving generalization. 
So this is what I call the, the, the compression bound. But the interesting story, which I, I really want to emphasize here, I know it's, uh, so how many of you actually want to see the details of this? No one, okay, good. <laughs> uh, this is important, but it's purely theory. At this point, just believe me, uh, and you don't have to, but believe me that this is the kind of result we get. And this is just an information theoretic argument. So essentially the dimensionality of the class behaves like two to the mutual information of the compression between x and t. So the more I compress, the better I generalize. And actually, the intuition is very simple. You quantize your, 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 your inputs into clusters. And then for each one of those clusters, I, I just have one label, one bit. So the number of possible clusters is two to the size of the number of these clusters. Two, two, for each cluster, I have a different bit. So the number of possible functions is two to the number of these bits. So that's essentially what it is. This is what, in learning theory, sometimes we call this mutual information, the, the query complexity. I mean, what is the minimal number of bits or labels, yes, no answers, that I should ask about my data in order to generalize well? And this is related to the, to the support vectors in support vector machines. It's related to the post minimal number of uh, independent questions in active learning. It has a lot of interpretations. So remember, mutual information is the minimal number of yes, no questions that I have to ask in order to about x in order to identify y. And that's essentially what comes here is, is the dimension of the learning problem. There's a small caveat here that you have to remember. There's something strange in this learning because the hypothesis class depends on the data. I'm actually changing my network according to the data and with it I compress the representation. This is a big no-no in learning theory. This is a guaranteed to overfit in some cases. But there's something strange, something very special about stochastic gradient descent that it doesn't overfit as badly as you could imagine. Okay, but now, now the interesting question is, okay, so I, am, I hope I convinced you that this information plan is actually an interesting uh, picture. There's something interesting going on in the way the, the network behave. So of course the next, the next question is, is there a limit? I mean, how far I can actually push my layers to the left? The answer is, again, very simple. Solve this problem. This is a, a purely mathematical problem, optimization problem. Find the optimal encoder. So x hat here is an abstract encoder. I don't care what it is. It can be the network, the layer of a network. It can be clustered. It can be any representation you have in mind. So I call it x hat, just as an information theory. And what I want is to find the, the most compressed representation of x, or the best encoder, but not, the best is of course zero, I can put it to zero by making them independent, but under a constraint on the information on y, which is under a constraint on generalization error. And how you do it, you put a Lagrange multiplier on y, on ixy, and you minimize this subject to this Markov chain, y, x, x, x. So this is something which we called the information bottleneck problem a long time ago, way before, be, way before it was uh, related to deep learning at least 20 years ago. And, uh, and uh, so beta is a positive Lagrange multiplier, which actually tells you, so those again, those who are a little bit familiar with information theory, this is very similar to the ray distortion problem. And this function that we get is essentially some sort of a ray distortion function, which means what is the best, most compressed representation at the given distortion, which in this case is the given information on y. Now, the interesting or the nice thing about it that it is gives me it gives me an explicit solution for the optimal encoder and the optimal decoder this and this. One of them is exponential in the KL divergence. This is again very intuitive between how well you can predict your output, your label from the data itself, versus how well you can predict it from the representation of the data, which is the layer in your matrix. And if this is small, then I have very good encoder. Okay, so, and, that's, and this is just exponential with this beta here. And then the, the decoder is actually the base optimal decoder, just the average of all possible encoders here. And the way we actually solve it is by iterating those equations. So essentially, we start with some encoder, we plug it there, then we calculate the decoder, then the encoder, we start some, some decoder, we plug it there, we get a, an encoder, then we plug it here, 
and we get another decoder, and we do iterations. These iterations are very much like EM, or like k-means, or like any other alternating projection type of algorithm, which there are many of them. And essentially, this is converging very nicely, and the rest are just details. Normalization. But what is nice about it, that this, this algorithm is giving me this black line. Beta is just one over the slope here. So changing beta takes me along this line. And this line is the absolute information theoretic bound on encoders and decoders. This is the best possible encoders and decoders, the trade-off between these two. At any given generalization error, the, the one on the line, which is given by this equation here, is the best possible way of encoding your data. Information theoretic, independent of the algorithm. If this is true for deep neural network, it's also true for your brain. It's also true for any alien out of space. I mean, and anybody who looks at this data cannot do better than this line. This is why we like information theoretic so much. Because now the question of what I argue is that with very high probability, deep neural network is pushing the layers to this line. Or stochastic gradient descent is pushing. So essentially, this very funny dynamics that you saw before is moving all the layers to this line. Now, if this is true, it's a big if, then this is, this is some sort of an optimality theorem for deep neural networks. Which means if they actually reach the line, nothing can do better. Yes? For the example of the animation, you, we, we have seen uh, like uh, half an hour ago, uh, this uh, black line would be much closer. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So, what, and, you, and this is just exaggerated for the illustration here. But in reality, the black line that you saw there was something like this. Very, very high, but it was still there. That's why you saw this little, little curvature. It was very close to a deterministic, completely deterministic rule. And that's actually a very, very important point. So, in order to actually get this line, I need py given x to be slightly away from the edges of the simplex, which means slightly away from 0 and 1. Otherwise, the whole thing collapsed. Uh, there was actually a, a paper submission, or maybe even a paper at ICML last year. We just discovered this point, that the IB needs uh, stochastic representations. OK, we know this for 20 years. If it's, uh, so, but I can always make it slightly stochastic by adding infinitesimal noise to my problem. And that's the way we actually do it. We, we take a deterministic rule and then soften it by passing it through a sigmoid. So and the probability of the label is now pushed away from 0, 1 a little bit. But then I can take the limit of deterministic. So there's a, an actually an analysis. It, this is just like adding a little noise to your problem, to the input of your function, and see the label. And this is, this is important for this theorem to hold. It's not that I'm telling you that the theorem is not true for deterministic functions. But I'm thinking about deterministic functions as a limit of zero noise stochastic function. This is, again, a little bit. Uh, uh, Technical, but anyway, so what is really important about this figure is that if you have, uh, so first of all, okay, I'm telling you that the layers move through these funny trajectories eventually very close to this line. So this is actually not so easy to, to establish, to measure it. We did it for small problems. So for so, so small problems, I can actually calculate this line analytically and then compare the mutual information of the encoder and the mutual information of the decoder and see where it is in this, in this uh, plane. And if it's close to the line or not close to the line. So that's what actually happens if we look at the problem I showed you. This is, you see, this I stretch here, all the, just the top of the, the curve from 0 0.98 bits to, to 1, and just the very top. And the blue line is this theoretical line, the information bottleneck line. <coughs> And the, the red crosses are just the, the, the layers. So remember, we did it 100 times. So there's a little scatter. And the scatter is what we call finite, sum, sum, finite size effects. I mean, when I increase, when the problem becomes much larger, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, error bars will, will shrink eventually and will be below the line. But you see that they're very, very close to the optimal line. But why do they overshoot the optimal? No, because a small, for a small problem, you can overshoot. It's only asymptotically the bound, OK? So that's a physicists call it finite size effect. But never mind. <laughs> so, so if you take a small problem, you can always uh, violate thermodynamics. But that's not a problem. <laughs> OK, so, so, so that's essentially what happens here. But you see, this is very convincing. 
And you see that each layer, this is the last hidden layer, each layer has a different value of beta, this Lagrange multiplier, which means that it's in a different place on the line. Now there's another issue which I again want to skip now, which is the finite sample size. So if I have only a finite sample, I cannot reach the black line. I can reach only this thing, which is called the, the red line or the finite sample bound. Essentially, this is just an approximation, which is essentially, so the empirical information and the true information get further and further away, like 2 to the i over m, square root of 2 to the i. This is essentially the same bound I saw before. So you see that here, if I don't compress, there's a very big difference between the true information and what I think is the information from the training data. But this, th so there's a nice maximum here, which is where this finite sample loss is minimized. And this is only if I compress the representation. So compression is essential. If you don't compress, you overfit. That's overfitting, the difference between these two things. It's the difference between the empirical error and the true error. OK, so that's, that's the reason why you really have to compress in order to generalize. But then, of course, some of you should jump on me. Because there are all sorts of uh, models, like ResNets and uh, RevNets, I don't know, there are all sorts of versions of ResNets, which are explicitly avoid compression. I mean, they have this reconstruction term, which tell us, OK, <laughs> try to be able to reconstruct the previous layer from this layer. So they, they put a lot of effort in avoiding this loss of information. So how does it sit with my theory? OK, so let's uh, keep this aside. I just want to, again, surface this question. This is an important question. And let's, let's try to understand why there is compression at all. Wow. OK, I have 15 minutes or something like this. This information plan dynamics here. But this time I look at it with the training error. Actually, it's generalization error, but it's the same thing here. And, and look what happened. It started with half, which is random. And then uh, after around 500 epochs or so, there is a knee. Which means that essentially the error saturates. It's not really saturating, it's uh, still uh, some gradient. But the gradient has a, it's very high here and very small here, uh, much smaller here. And there's a very clear knee here, the sharp change of slope. Now, I, I argue this is always the case. I mean, uh, you start, maybe sometimes it takes a long time to get out of this point, but then eventually you drop, and then, and then you, you almost saturate. There's, it's not, it can't be zero. So the slope, there's still gradient that pushes you somewhere. But the gradient saturates. You see that they, they converge, essentially, the slope converts to zero. But you see that those uh, compression that I talked about still continue, even when the slope is essentially zero. So what's going on here? So essentially, I'm telling you, look, the training error got essentially saturated. You already exhaust your data in terms of fitting the labels. But the representation is still changing. Look at these yellow lines. They still move to the left. So something very interesting happens. I mean, so this over crunching of my data, where the, zero, the gradients are very, very small, because the, the, the derivative of the error is very, very small, is still helping my generalization. So how can it be? I actually exhausted all my labels. All of them are perfectly fit now. But I still learn or improve my generalization by keep on doing this stochastic gradient descent. OK, so most people actually say this is a, this is a myth. I mean, you can hear it from a lot of theoreticians. Stochastic the noise doesn't help you. Actually, you know, it does help you. So look, what happens in stochastic <coughs> gradient descent? So what, what do we do? I'm sure you know that. We actually divide my training data into mini batches. Uh, originally, by the way, this was done for computational reasons. I mean, we wanted to save time. But these mini batches give you a noisy version of the gradient. Okay? The average of all the mini batches gradients is the true gradient. And if the gradient is essentially zero as here, then it's essentially zero. <laughs> but those mini batches have noise. I mean they're noisy. Why they're noisy? Because the examples are different. They have slightly different examples. And the noise is due to the differences in the examples in all the irrelevant parts of the story. Let's say I have an image of me. So you know, in some places I have a board next to me, and some other I have a, a friend next to me, and some other I have one I have a hat, and one I have a glasses. And all these things are irrelevant. <laughs> I have to ignore them. Nothing in the data tells me to ignore my glasses or to ignore my hat. 
the only, the only way that I can learn it is by looking at the fluctuations, which means some examples are sensitive to the fact that I have had some examples that are not sensitive. This will cause, this is precisely the reason of the fluctuations of the mini batches. Now what I argue now, it, so this is actually my, my network, the one I'm playing with right now. It has these six hidden layers, and, and, and never mind. So it has this Eiffel Tower, which is important for some of the aspects of my story, but it's really not important eventually. I can have very different architectures, and I have the... Now, what you see here are the gradients. So everything, is, the story is in the gradients of the error. Forget about information. <laughs> everything is because of the gradients of the error. Now let's look at the gradient. So the gradients have two numbers. One is the mean gradient, which is this solid line, which means, okay, I calculate it per weight. So I calculate the calcul average gradient of every layer divided by the number of weights. That's why it is fixed uh, to some number here. And I do it for every one of the layers separately. That's by the way that something that most people didn't do until last, now it's, it's done everywhere. Look at every layer separately. It's very, very important. So you see in different colors, the red is the first hidden layers and so on. And uh, so you see this is the mean gradient. It starts with something like uh, point 0.1. It's a log log plot. And then it's a, a, you see this nice dispersion that go down, essentially an order of magnitude or something like this up until here. But the interesting story is in the standard deviation, the variance of the gradients. So remember, the variance is, is over the mini batches. So the gradients in these different mini batches are, are different. So I can calculate the standard deviation, or, or the covariance matrix, if you want. So we took the covariance matrix over all the gradients in every layer. Of course, this is something you can do only in small networks, so that's all right. Then we, take, we took the trace of this covariance, so we are independent of anything, and, and divided by weight, per weight. And that's what you see here in the dashed line. And then you see this very striking thing. So again, this is a log-log plot, up to about 300 epochs, which is exactly this place where they started to compress. The mean is uh, about two orders of magnitude larger than the standard deviation. What, which what it means is essentially there are no fluctuations in the gradients. They're very, very clean. So the batch-to-batch the -batch fluctuations are small. At this point, almost suddenly, but not really suddenly, the gradients go down a little bit. They also disperse. You see, the gradient in the, in the lower layer is much larger than the, la the gradient in the last layer, and that's because of the back propagation. Remember that the gradients move from here to here, so the noise is accumulated. They accumulate each other. So this is why you see this dispersion. But you also see a very sharp increase in the standard deviation. And at this, from 300 to 10,000 or whatever, the standard deviation is much larger than the mean. So this is why I call this high SNR, or high signal to noise ratio gradient. And this is low SNR. OK. So there are distinctly two different phases. One, I have very clean gradient. This is what in physics we call drift. I mean, essentially, I just pushed by the gradient to uh, some sort of a local minima. Actually, it's a flat canyon. It's not one minima. There are many, many minima connected to each other. And here, I'm actually doing essentially Random walk. I just move randomly my weight. It's very small drift. <coughs> so this is why I call this a drift, and this is the diffusion. Now let's try to understand what happens in the diffusion. So remember, my networks have no regularization. So I don't bound the value of their weights. I mean, they can grow forever. And this is true both for sigmoid and, and for values, whatever. Values, actually, you can't train without regularization because they, the, the weights never saturate. <laughs> they grow forever. With sigmoids, there is a saturation of the derivative, and you get this uh, vanishing gradient phenomena. So some people don't like, but actually, this stops everything. <laughs> so uh, but what if you look at the, the, the norm, the L2 norm of the, the weights, you see that up to this point, which is here, because I'm here counting iteration updates, not, not epochs, never mind that. The slope of the, the weights is, again, log-log plot. That's why I always, everything I plot is in log-log. That's, that's, that's things look a lot simpler there. I know that uh, computer scientists never do this, but physicists do it all the time. <laughs> so, so this is a, a linear growth, which means, essentially, my weights grow linearly with time. 
as you can expect from a drift phase. I mean, I just add the same numbers one to each other, and the average, the average growth is linear. But at this point, there is a change of slope, which I hope you see. It goes from essentially one to about half, actually even less than half. So half, exponent half, which is a slope half in this log-log plot, is exactly what you expect for, from a random walk. A random walk, you, get, you grow like square root of t. I hope you all know that. OK, so that's very nice. This is a square root of t growth. So I, I really see this. There is a drift phase here and a diffusion phase here. So why is this helping me? So here is uh, the gist of the, the rest of the story. I really have to cut short. OK, so I have a theorem. It's a bit tricky theorem. But uh, essentially what I'm saying is that because of this noisy phase, the diffusion phase, the signal, this diffusion phase is responsible for suppressing the irrelevant features, which are many. You know, that's like filtering out all the irrelevant frequencies, or filtering out the fact that I have a hat or I have a glasses or whatever in my image, or whatever it is. There are many, many. Most of the features of the image are irrelevant. I have to remember just very few. So what I'm saying is that t here is time, the number of iterations that the mutual information between two consecutive layers in my network is bounded by some constant which depends on the relevant dimension of the manifold in this case, plus something which decays with time, like t to the minus alpha, where alpha is this diffusion exponent. So if it's half, it's, it's, it's minus half. If it's, uh, so this is decaying with time. So eventually, this is the reason for the compression. And the proof of it is, is actually very intuitive, and I just want to finish with that. This exponent? No, the, the, the term diffusion phase. Yes, so well it's, it's well defined. It's, it's essentially the knee in your training error, the position of the knee, or if you want the change in the slope of the weights. You can see it without calculating information or anything. Just look at TensorFlow, look at the gradients, and plot these covariance matrices, and you see this immediately. OK, so that it's, it's a very sharp flip. And we see it, by the way, in all the networks. I, I didn't have time to show it, but we see it in, 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 a, in a, this is, for example, in, in MNIST or in CIFAR, or I don't know where. You see this type of trajectories. This is actually MNIST. And you see the gradients. It's actually very simple. At this point, the standard deviation goes above the mean. So you see this flip of the transition. This is the transition point. When, when the standard deviation of the, no, of the gradients exceeds the, the mean. And by the way, you can ask, and you should ask, what happens if I don't use mini batches? Or what happens if the mini batch is very large or very small? This is a very small, very interesting question. I'll answer it if somebody asks, but now let me go on. So essentially, I have to finish. I, mean, I know I'm very close to the end. So, uh, so essentially, what I'm saying is the following. And that's really the, the new result here, which I want to emphasize. So what happens to the weights? is that during this drift phase, I'm actually converging to a, a local minima, very close to a local minima. The error is very small. It's a very shallow, what we call flat minima. It's actually not one minimum. It's a manifold of good solutions, that are all connected. That's uh, another story that we talk about, the geometry of the landscape of the energy. But we know that there are many, many possible good solutions, and they are locally connected. Remember, they are connected along the directions which are irrelevant. I mean, I can change the weights in this direction without hurting my error. But once I try to change it in the relevant direction, I immediately hurt my error. So it's like a very narrow canyon, which is folded all over the place. OK, now you get, in the first phase, you actually fall into this canyon. In the second phase, you start to diffuse. So where, where is the diffusion most effective? So the, if I look at the, co the covariance matrix, it's very narrow in the relevant dimension. And it's very wide in the irrelevant dimension, because then I can make changes in my weights without hurting the error. Because these are, these are irrelevant dimension. I, can, I don't want my label to be sensitive to the fact that I have glasses or not. So changing this will not, will not affect the error. And therefore, I'm starting to diffuse mostly in the irrelevant dimensions. So I can divide my weights into two parts. The first one is what I call the relevant part which is this projection to the local minima. This is what I learned during the drift phase. 
mostly. But then there is this delta W, which is this accumulated diffusion, or accumulate random walk in the weights, which is keeping, keep growing with time like square root of t. OK, so now I'm doing the following exercise. It may be a little bit too technical, but let me try it anyway. I can write the k plus 1 layer as some nonlinear function, let's call it sigma, of the dot of the product of the matrix wk plus delta w by the previous layer. So this is a linear part of this, the network. So there's a linear function and then a nonlinearity. And I forget about pooling and all that. I mean, this is not important. These are all linear things. Now, this I break into WKCCA plus delta W, and delta W times TK, and that's, very, that's a tricky statement, effectively behaves like noise. It's a big random matrix, although it's, a it's an accumulated random walk. And when I multiply a random and independent vector by a big random matrix, I get something which effectively looks like Gaussian noise. This is exactly where my comment before has to be taken with care. I mean, that actually, it's not really random. It's a fixed randomness. I, I don't change the weights. The weights are now frozen. But that's, believe me, that we know how to handle that. So this means that the information between this and this is bounded by the information of this linear channel, which is, in, in, in information theory, we call it a Gaussian channel. And, and, uh, and, and this is a Gaussian independent noise. So this, the, 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 this information is bounded by the capacity of the Gaussian channel, which is half log 1 plus SNR. So the signal here is w times t. And this acts like noise, because it's completely random. It's delta w times t. And this is the signal to noise ratio. So now I play a little bit with this. Essentially, what you get, uh, so, so I take this log and, and, uh, and expand it, because this is a small term. It's bounded by this. And then I take out the time dependence, and I get this theorem. So essentially, all the irrelevant information is decaying with a, a rate of t to the minus alpha. So that's very nice. And I'm, just, I'm finishing in, in, one, in one minute, in, in five minutes. So essentially, this has a very interesting implication, which is completely independent of anything. The time to converge to a good solution with k layers, if they're all compressed independently, that's a, a very big if, scales like the number of layers to this power law minus 1 over alpha, where alpha is the diffusion exponent, which is half in my case, close to half. This is the time to converge with one layer. And this is the time to converge with k layers. Now, that's very non-intuitive. I'm actually telling you, using this information theoretic hand waving, that, uh, that uh, more layers converge faster. Is it true? I mean, nobody said it before. Usually what people say is that uh, the number of time to converge is polynomial in the number of layers. OK, that's very nice. I'm telling you it's a negative polynomial of the number of layers. It actually goes like a negative power of the number of layers. So is it true? Or is it just my hallucination? So we looked at it, of course. This is the number of layers, the log number of layers. This is the log number of iterations. The orange line is the theoretical prediction. And the blue line is what we actually see. I think it's a nice fit. I mean. More layers with two layers, you're almost half the, the number of iterations. With three layers, you're almost. And it, it goes like a very nice power law. OK, so more layers converge faster. Right, is it always true? All the way? I mean, this sounds strange. I mean, I take infinite layers, and I have to converge immediately. No? <laughs> OK, so it doesn't make any sense at some point. <laughs> and, and the question is, what is, where is this turning point? So this is a, an interesting story. So this is what happens. In MNIST, by the way, this is a true problem. I mean, now I don't need to, to estimate information. I do the, a very simple measurement. Count the number of updates of the weights as a function of the number of layers. And I have all the layers equal. That's what we did with IPS, NIPS. And what you see here is the number of iteration again. And uh, sorry, this is the loss. It's written here somewhere. <laughs> this is the loss, which means the error, the log, log loss. A and this is uh, the number of iterations. And you see this very funny thing. I mean, so again, in log-log plot, you see this, uh, OK, so smaller, more layers actually start to decay f slower. This is actually also a power law. To see this equal spaces in log-log plot is also always a power law. <laughs> so, so this is a power law. 
But the interesting part is this parallel. Look how long does it take to converge to the minimum. And this is the parallel I described. So there's a some, some sort of a twist here. The, the small, small number of layers start to move faster, but eventually converge late. So all the, the order of the lines twist somewhere in between. And eventually, you get this very nice power law in there. Now what happens, so you see this, uh, this curve. I mean, so essentially, the number of, uh, the no as a function of the number of layers, I go down initially, but then I start to climb away, to climb up. Actually, so we, once we saw this, we looked at, at even more layers. So this is 20 layers or something, 16 layers. And, uh, and you see, again, the same picture, a, a nice power law in the beginning of the training, and then another power law at the end, but then, beyond a certain number of, of layers, you're starting to pay. OK, so that's the first, the first evidence that I am aware of, that there's an optimal number of layers. Beyond this number of layers, you're, starting, you're not effective. And you're not effective because the layers start to compress the same function. They fall on each other. In, in this information plane, I don't gain anything by adding more layers. Notice, by the way, that I have this increase in the error after the minimum. This is overfitting, again. I mean, I mean I have, I, this is overtraining. I mean, I'm training too much, and the error starts to climb again. So this is a very nice overfitting. If I add more examples, this will, the whole thing will go down and come up later. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is something which you, has nothing to do with mutual information or with information theory or anything. It's pure dynamics. Number of iterations versus number of layers. And you see something completely surprising just by this information theoretic analysis. You, inc you, you inc convert faster with more layers up to a point, and then you start to pay. And the interesting point is to identify this minimum. That's where you really want to stop your. Now, I'm out of time. There's another chapter, which you may find on some of my YouTube talks. I don't know. I'm starting to talk. Which is, where are those layers converged? To? Can we actually interpret them? And the interesting story, and again, just to give you the, the gist of it, is that they converge to very special places along the information curve. The information curve is this limit, the, the black line. Uh, uh, again, OK, this is where they converge to. I just want to show you that they, they are very systematic, converge to very specific, depending on the size of the data. Uh, and these places are predictable from the problem alone, not from the architecture. And there are the places where the convergence diverge or slow down. So this is, again, a dynamic phenomenon. It has to do with the number of iterations it takes me. At these places, there, there are changes in the topology. So whenever the topology of the representation changes dramatically, the layers slow down. And more layers help me to avoid this, this slowing down, the what we call critical slowing down of the, of the convergence. And that's really the, the most beautiful part of the story, which is unpublished here, but we're working on it now. And that everything that is determined by, by the changes of the topology, and essentially the layers, OK, this is just to confuse you, but uh, <laughs> this is the number of iterations as a function of, and, and these are the critical points that I mentioned. And you see that at the critical points, there's a divergence of the number of iterations. That's all I want you to see, which means that Whenever I have to change the topology of the representation, I need to move points apart. I have to change the clusters. I pay heavily computationally. And this is, again, it comes from this information theoretic analysis alone. But it's a, some sort of dynamic analysis of the mutual information. And that's getting very close to interpreta interpretable de deep learning. I mean, I can actually begin to tell you what each layer represents eventually in some simple problems. OK, I think I'll stop here. If you have more questions or you're just completely shocked, uh, let me just summarize briefly what I said. So first of all, only two numbers per layer is matter. The, the mutual information of the encoder and the mutual information of the decoder. If you remember this, it's already good. Then I'm telling you that the advantage of many layers, despite what other t people tell you, is not just expressivity. I mean, I can express more function. It's also dynamic. I converge faster with more layers. But if I have too many layers, I'm starting to pay with time. And that the location, and this is the last, the last thing which I didn't have time to, to tell you, is that the location of the layers in this plan is predictable from the problem alone. And it depends on the changes in the topology of the representation. 
And in some toy problems, you actually solve it analytically, almost analytically, because we accumulate new results all the time. We are also some, some papers, not that many. Altogether, about this particular subject, four papers are on the web. Two with Ravid Schwartz, one with Noga Zoslavsky, and one with uh, Amichai and Ravid. Amichai uh, Pensky, who is going to be here in statistics uh, next year. But uh, uh, none of them is, uh, have all the story. <laughs> so you have to look at my slides. If you want, I'll, I'll keep them here. And, and you <laughs> have to ask me for the papers. I hope that by the end of the summer to get uh, at least a good review. Unfortunately, there's too much there, and my students don't write it as much as I would like them to do it. I can't do it. <laughs> so I have to do it myself, and that's, uh, that's slow. But it will happen. So you're absolutely right. This is the most critical question. You need to read it slowly. But if you actually pause my video and listen to it carefully, you can do it yourself. <laughs> just, just try to understand the connection between the thing that I'm saying. And, but I hope I convince you that it's an, an interesting story. Maybe completely wrong, but at least interesting. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Ah, oh, oh, okay, so th th there are many other explanations uh, that I attempt to ex explain. None of them is, so, is as comprehensive. I mean, so, for example, there is the theory of Chaim Sampolinsky that tells you that essentially the layers uh, cluster. It's a very similar story, by the way, but it's using entirely different uh, mathematics, not, not mentioning information even once. But, but eventually, the, 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 the layers really get sharper and sharper clusters. And eventually, which is some sort of reduction of signal-to-noise ratio. There are several works that followed us, including a very interesting paper by uh, Yuri Polyansky and uh, Ziv. I'm not sure about his first name in Israeli uh, works at MIT. Yeah, and, and there, there are papers by some French physicists, especially physicists, by the way, like it a lot. So there's a lot, of, a lot of papers in the physics community. By the way, our papers is also mostly p published in the physics uh, journals now because it's much easier than the... When I send things to NIPS or the ICML or to anything, I clear when I get re reviews which are completely orthogonal to anything I'm saying. And they usually <laughs> complain on the size of the problems and then uh, why do I need information and why do I estimate information. I mean, it's, it's, you need to zoom out a little bit and see the big picture, and that's hard. But so I don't complain, I just don't manage to get these papers into this conference. But I had invited talks all over the place, and some of them are recorded, so you can actually see uh, a lot of this story everywhere. But you're absolutely right. Anybody who complains that there are no, it's not written down is absolutely correct, and it should be written down, yeah. And it will be, soon enough. Yes? You mentioned the ResNet uh, type of network. Yes, OK, good. That's a very, actually, Hinton asked me this question immediately after seeing my first video. Uh, so what happens in ResNet? So it's not only ResNet. I mean, you know that th there was a, there's this new version of ResNet which is called RevNet. Uh, it's not really a big deal for computer scientists because the improvement in performance is negligible. But it's uh, interesting conceptually because they actually force the map from network for layer to layer to be completely reversible. So they can actually uh, reconstruct the previous layer from any layer by adding essentially more nodes to the hidden layer. And so I, I think about it this way. Some of the nodes are used to predict the label, and some of the nodes are used to reconstruct the previous layer. They actually add another term to the error, which is this reconstruction term. Now, my story is precisely correct for ResNets when you look only at the predictive part of the layers. The reconstructing parts is some sort of an addition that somehow helps the compression. It's a better compression. So no, it's just like why JPEG is better for visions than, uh, I don't know, Lempel-Ziv. Okay, Lempel-Ziv is completely ignorant of the structure of the problem. So it will take forever for Lempel-Ziv to compress images very well. JPEG actually assumed this uh, patch decomposition, this neighborhood, this Markov random field more or less, and therefore it's immediately doing a better job. Now the ResNets are in some sense forcing local decompositionality and therefore compress better. There's another interesting story uh, which related to symmetries. So I actually argue that symmetric problems, for example, translation invariant objects or rotation invariant objects, or any, any, any group of transformations that you can act on your object and will not change the label, is actually helping the compression, compression immediately. So that's why convolution neural networks immediately compress because they, all the translated images are mapped to the same thing at the second or third layer.
So this is just one example of how symmetry helps you in, and actually does compression. Now resonance in some sense is doing this, it's actually enhancing the compression, but to see this is a little harder. The interesting part is, is what is, how do you reconcile what I said before, that this is a completely reversible map and I'm still talking about loss of information. So again, strictly speaking, there's no loss of information. You just move to higher moments of the distribution and therefore simple decoder will not see it. And that's a slightly more technical point. Yeah. Anyway, I think I have to finish. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.